Creation in the Prophetic Literature, Part 1. We've been going through the two companion books uh, by, uh, edited by Gerald Klingbeil, um, the Genesis Creation Account and its Reverberations in the Old Testament, and he spoke and it was Divine Creation in the Old Testament. Um, there are the covers of the books. Um, right now we are in Chapter 8, Part 1 of the uh, entitled Creation in the Prophetic Literature of the Old Testament, an Intertextual Approach. Um, this is written by Martin Klingbeil, who is the son of Gerald Klingbeil. Um, uh, he's currently at Southern Adventist University in College Dale, Tennessee, but also teaches at Stellenbosch University in South Africa. Um, note one, I will read before we get into the chapter, uh, to note that uh, Martin was not chosen just because he's the son of Gerald Klingbeil, but because he actually has worked on this area before and they uh, decided to try to get uh, the material that he'd written basically into the book. The chapter was originally published in a slightly different form in the Journal of the Adventist Theological Society in spring of 2009. It is reprinted by permission of the author and the publisher. So with that, we begin with the introduction by Martin Klingbeil. <clears throat> the topic of creation in the Old Testament theology for most of its recent history, and that's where that note comes in, has been neglected and has often been relegated to the level of a subheading within the sections of soteriology, covenant, trinity, or any other somewhat related topic. Nevertheless, quoting somebody, uh, nevertheless creation to this day has been one of the proverbial stepchildren in the recent discipline of Old Testament theology. Well, Rolf Rentdorf, I guess he's the guy who actually wrote that, uh, only diagnoses the problem. Walter Brueggemann, in looking for a rationale, refers the responsibility for the peripheral pers uh, position of creation in theology to the dichotomy between Israelite faith and Canaanite religion, or history and myth, that found its way into biblical theology during the earlier part of the last century through scholars like Gerhard von Rad, who suggested that creation was subservient to salvation, or Ernest Wright, who maintained that Israel was little interested in nature. The uh, yellow ellipses are mine. Um, I'm not going to read the entire thing, but we're going to come pretty close because this is pretty uh, rich material. A number of scholars moved beyond the paradigm created by von Rad and recognized the prominence of creation in the theological thinking of the Old Testament, both in terms of position and content. In the, his work on Genesis 1 through 11, Klaus Westermann places creation in history throughout, through its expression in myth and ritual. Thus, it is the primeval event, and the stories told about and enacted upon it are part of the universal traditions of humankind. The biblical authors, for Westermann it was uh, the Yahwist and the priestly author, adopted these stories theologically for Israel and identified them as part of God's work of blessing, which for Westermann really meant, really means the power of fertility. In direct and intentional contrast with von Rad, the doctrine has been described by Hans Heinrich Schmidt as the horizon of biblical theology. He relates creation to world order, and by comparing it with creation beliefs in other ancient Near Eastern cultures, he arrives at the conclusion that history is the realization of this order. Quoting him, only within this horizon could Israel understand its special experiences with God in history. One wonders if Schmidt is not committing the mistake of earlier biblical theologians and looking for the mythic of Old Testament and finding it in creation. And if you wonder why uh, Martin is saying that, it sounds like he's, he has the middle of Old Testament the, uh, uh, theology in God himself and that creation is a secondary part of that. Nevertheless, it appears that in most cases the dating of texts lies at the bottom of the question as to where to position creation within the framework of Old Testament theology. 
While the Bible begins with creation, biblical theologies mostly do not, since traditional critical approaches to the Old Testament text do not allow for an early dating of the Ergeschichte, uh, pardon my German, in Genesis 1 and 11, the first history. Most of these studies, von Rod's included, have rather taken Isaiah 40 through 55, the so-called Deutero-Isaiah, dated by critical scholars to post-exilic times, as a chronologically secure paradigm for creation in the Old Testament, against which other texts, including also Genesis 1 through 3, are then benchmarked. So if you know when Isaiah 40 through 55 was created, then you can figure out when various other texts had to be written as well. This leads inevitably to the conclusion that creation is a late addition to the theological thinking of the Old Testament. Implicit in this approach is the danger of circular reasoning since creation texts are being dated on the basis of religious historical paradigms as late, at, as late and then are used to date other creation passages accordingly. So it's all late. It is obvious, and again this is a quote, it is obviously somewhat paralyzing to realize that we form a picture of Israel's religious history in part on the basis of certain texts which, in turn, with the help of the picture obtained by historical research, we subsequently judge with respect to authenticity and historical truth. It's kind of a neat trick, see? You, know, you can just shave off any evidence that doesn't fit your theory. The ineffectiveness of such a dating scheme that is rendered even less reliable as a result of being informed by a particular school of thought, pardon me, the ineffectiveness of such a dating scheme, yeah, that's right, that is rendered even less reliable as a result of being informed by a particular school of thought with regard to religion, Israelite religious history, we'll come back to that, means that a more adequate approach to the topic of creation in the Old Testament should depart from a contextual reading of the text in question in the various bodies of Old Testament literature, um, at least ignoring the standard way of looking at things. The prophetic literature of the Old Testament provides a rich tapestry for such a reading, since the implicit nature of prophecy in the Old Testament is reformative in nature. In other words, referring back to the historic deeds of Yahweh in the past, creation, exodus, conquest, and so on, and thus motivating a return to him in the respective present. While there are studies that have touched on the subject of creation in individual prophetic books, there's need for a more synthetic treatment of the issue under, dis under question, which is, of course, what Martin Klingbeil started in 2009 and is being asked to reprint here. The present study will, therefore, provide a survey of creation in the prophetic literature of the Old Testament. For example, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, the Book of the Twelve, and Daniel. Although the order of presentation will be rather more chronological than canonical, and we're going to see that in just a minute, based on this survey, we may be able to determine if the Old Testament prophets base their understanding of creation on the model as presented in Genesis 1 through 3, or if their cosmology allowed for alternate models of creation. Methodological questions, uh, how are we going to do this? Two points need attention before evaluating the evidence of creation in the Old Testament prophets. The first is the question of intertextuality, one text referring to another. Based on the above mentioned observation that much of the prophets' messages are intrinsically evocative of earlier texts creating points of reference to events in the course of Israel's history, but at the same time, applying them to their present contexts. The second issue relates to the first and refers to the question of how can one identify references to creation in the prophetic literature of the Old Testament. Intertextuality. Intertextuality has recently come into focus in biblical scholarship although it appears to be rather elusive when being subjected to an attempt at finding a universal definition of the concept. A number of approaches have been included under this umbrella term, but I would in define intertextuality broadly as references between texts that can occur on multiple levels. While its boundaries are often determined by the view of the composition of scriptures that the author employing the term has. <clears throat> 
at times. Intertextuality also puts various texts on a complicated timeline and thus gives rise to chronological considerations which have been out of focus to some extent from biblical studies in the vogue of literary criticism. I'm sorry. The following timeline will form the baseline of my recording of the Old Testament prophets which will serve as the chronological framework in which the use, uh, usage of creation text in the prophetic books has to be read. And there's the timeline. And uh, for this particular part, uh, as opposed to next week, we're going to be talking about Jonah, Amos, Hosea, Micah, and Isaiah. With the help of this rough timeline, I hope to be able to demonstrate how the theological thinking during the period reflected in the prophetic literature of the Old Testament has been progressively shaped by a continuous hermeneutic of returning to this pivotal point of origin, creation. This also implies that I regard the prophetic literature of the Old Testament as subsequent to the original history Genesis 1 through 11, a point that can be argued both on a literary and historical level, but that will hopefully become even more apparent when it can be demonstrated how the prophets were constantly looking back at creation. Thus, Genesis 1 through 3 becomes the point of reference to which the prophets return when they employ creation terminology and motifs. Creation markers. In order to recognize intertextual creation markers, our criteria have to be sufficiently broad, thus moving beyond a purely semantic level, but also narrow enough to connect us positively with the creation account of Genesis. A broad range of devices that often belong to totally different discourses are invoked by scholars in order to identify creation in the prophets. Allusion, tradition, motif, theme, imagery, metaphor, and so on. It is probably safe to divide these into three main groups. One, lexical, using the very words. Two, literary. And three, conceptual. And we'll go over those last two. Um, in the following, I will present examples taken from the prophetic literature of the Old Testament from each group that reconnects in some way with Genesis 1 through 3. Lexical creation markers. Semantic field. Lexical markers in the prophets depart from the semantic field, uh, centering around the theologically most specific lemma, bara, to create. For example, Isaiah 40, 26, or Amos 4, 13. It further includes yatsar, to form, shape. For example, Isaiah 45, 18. The rather generic asa, which means it isn't quite as specific a marker to make or do, and its derivatives. But when it, God is referred to as our maker, that's a fairly specific reference. And the more summon pa'al, to do, produce. Um, to mention only the most uh, prominent ones that also appear in the prophets. However, all these words also describe activities beyond creation as found in Genesis 1 through 3, which is an indicator of how the reflection on creation serves as a departure point for the creation of new meanings. Word pairs. Word pairs like the merism, samayim, or eretz, heaven or earth, in Isaiah 37, 26, uh, 16, and we're going to come across another word pair uh, later on in Isaiah 65, and hosek, or or, darkness or light, in Isaiah 42, 16, and Isaiah 45, 7, of course, coming from the first day of Genesis, um, re re represent strong reference markers to creation. Quotes, an author often interrupts the flow of his argument with a quote in order to authenticate, substantiate, or expand the argument. Apart from direct quotes, which are usually introduced by a static formula, for example, nine, uh, uh, Daniel 9.13, which is, we'll talk about next week, but has to do with uh, uh, as it is written in the book of Moses. We also find inverted quotes of the creation account, such as Ezekiel 36.11, which we'll also discuss next week, where the order of verbs from the original Genesis 1.28 is reversed, 
in order to call attention to the connection between the theology of creation and recreation, uh, in this case, uh, as restoration after the exile. Allusions. Allusions create less intense lexical reference markers, but are widely used in the prophetic literature of the Old Testament. An allusion is an incomplete or fragmented reference to another text, and thus is less easily recognized recognizable and more prone to a misinterpretation. Nevertheless, when the prophet says in Zephaniah 1.3, which again we'll discuss next week, I will sweep away both man and beast, I will sweep away the birds of the sky and the fish in the sea, the allusion to creation is made by reversing the order of creatures as they have been listed in Genesis 1, making a theologically significant statement of reversing creation and separating from the creation, creator. Let's so start with man, beast, and then the birds and the fish on day five. Literary creation markers. Metaphors. The prophets use a number of metaphors for God, and some of them can be used as creation markers. The use of the call participle of Yatsar in reference to Yahweh as a potter in Isaiah 45.9 serves as a good uh, example for the creation subtext of this metaphor. You may remember that Yatsar is what was done to Adam. Um, poetry, I've shown elsewhere that the authors of the Hebrew Bible use poetry in order to communicate important theological co contents. Interestingly, the, most of the contexts in which the creation texts are found in the prophets are poetic in nature. While in itself it would not be a sufficiently strong marker, I would have to agree with that, the use of poetry indicates the presence of a theologically important theme, and therefore, uh, in combination with something else, might, might indicate uh, a reference to creation. Conceptual creation markers, motifs. Although Yahweh is a king is another metaphor that could be met, mentioned in terms of creation. In a broader sense, kingship itself can serve as a motif alluding to creation. I, I think here we're reaching just a little bit uh, without some other indications, but sometimes there are. Kingship in Israel has had to do with building and maintaining the divinely created world order. While Yahweh is the builder of Jerusalem after the Babylonian exile, he is also the builder of Eve in Genesis 2.22, whereas in both instances, the lexical creation marker, bana, or to build, is used. Typologies. Typologies preserve the historicity of events or personalities from the past and transcend them theologically into the present. Creation as a historical event is used in the prophetic literature as a type for present and future restoration, and con the concluding chapters of Isaiah use the reference to creation as a type for the recreation of a new heaven and a new earth in Isaiah 65:17. Some of you may recognize that. It becomes apparent that there's a wide range of creation markers which the prophets employed in their writings to refer to the ergastishi. Some of them are easily discernible while others only establish loose links which create a certain sliding scale on which intertextual relationships can be constructed. The point that needs to be made at this stage is the frequency with which this hermeneutic procedure was used, indicating that the prophets built their theology around pivotal themes such as the creation motif. Creation in the prophets. In the following, we will evaluate the prophetic literature of the Old Testament against the above mentioned markers. As already indicated above, we will follow a rough chronological sequence based on our intertextual considerations, since the establishment of a timeline is fundamental in evaluating the theological usage and development of creation in the prophetic literature of the Old Testament. Obviously, an attempt to present an exhaustive account of creation in 16 books of varied length, which accounts for almost one-third of the Old Testament, is destined for failure from the outset. Therefore, the only realistic approach will be a panoramic flight over the prophetic books, which is what we'll do, an overview rather than a detailed study. Eighth century B.C. prophets Jonah, Amos, Hosea, Micah, and Isaiah belong to the group of 8th century B.C. prophets. This represents an impressive mix of messengers and messages. Jonah directed his prophecies toward the international arena, while 
Amos and Hosea addressed the northern kingdom. Micah and Isaiah prophesied in Judah before or until after the fall of Samaria. The geographic spread should give us a good indication of the pervasiveness of creation thought during this century. Jonah. Jonah's message is replete with ecological content and as such alludes to creation. When introducing himself to the sailors, Jonah defines himself as a follower of the creator God in a language that is reminiscent of creation in the Decalogue. Yahweh, God of heaven, I worship or fear, who made the sea and the dry land. One cannot but notice the somewhat problematic but very emphatic sentence structure where the predicate ani yare, literally I fear, is inserted between the object wa'et yahweh and its qualifying relative clause asher asa. Jonah sees himself surrounded by Yahweh, the God of creation, although ironically he is not quite sure if he should worship or fear him. Actually, he fears him at that point. Um, the progressive descent to the depths of the ocean in Jonah's psalm, indicated by the verbal root yarab, to descend, in Jonah 2, 6 and also in Jonah 3, 1, verse 3 and 5, can be related to Genesis 1 through 3, according to the ancient Near Eastern and, and also to some extent Old Testament cosmologies, there is a spatial dimension of above and below, for, uh, that is, the earth rested on pillars and waters under which the realm of Sheol was to be found. So you do find that picture in the Old Testament, according to Klingbeil. All these elements appear in Jonah's poem. He finds himself cast into the heart of the sea and cast out of God's presence, Jonah 2.5. Uh, if you're looking up in the Masoretic text, it's 2.6. As Adam and Eve were cast out of Eden, Genesis 3.4, he passes through the chaotic waters in Jonah 2.5 and finally descends to Sheol, um, or the pit, Jonah 2.2 or Jonah 2.6. Jonah is sinking toward darkness and death, away from light and creation, a process that is equivalent to decreation, I would say, at least for Jonah. In the whole book, obedient creation is, is in juxtaposition to disobedient humanity. And the creator is portrayed as continually being involved, involved in his creation by throwing a storm at Jonah, appointing a fish to his twofold rescue by letting it swallow the disobedient prophet, and letting the fish vomit him onto solid ground. He furthermore prepares a plant, a worm, and an east wind to bring his despondent servant to his senses. Creation is not just an event of the past, but reoccurs through Yahweh's permanent involvement in his creation and with his creatures. But foremost, all creation is geared towards Yahweh's salvation act, towards humanity, and the question that concludes the book of Jonah finds its answer in the book's presence in the canon, reiterating Jonah's belief in the supreme creator God as initially and ironically stated in his confession to the heathen sailors. Moving on to Amos. Creation in Amos is based on an analogy of history. Yahweh is presented as the creator who is continuously in con interacting with his creation. This occurs in a concept, context of threatening judgment, but also promising salvation. Creation terminology appears predominantly in the three hymns, that we're going to see in just a minute, that play a structuring role in the overall layout of the book. Hymn number one, uh, Amos 4.13. He, he who forms the mountains, who creates the wind, who, and who reveals his thoughts to mankind, who turns dawn to darkness and treads on the heights of the earth, the Lord God Almighty is his name. Uh, Amos 5, 8, and 9. He who made the Pleiades and Orion, who turns midnight into dawn and darkens day into night, who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out over the face of the land. The Lord is his name. With a blinding flash, he destroys the stronghold and brings the fortified city to ruin. 
So here's God who creates and also who is, is uh, involved in destroying. And then Amos 9, 5, and 6. The Lord, the Lord Almighty, he touches the earth and it melts, and all who live in it mourn. The whole land rises like the Nile, then sinks like the river of Egypt. He builds his lofty palaces in the heavens and sets its foundation on the earth. He calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out over the face of the land. The Lord is his name. Almost um, those last two sound like they refer to the flood as well as creation. Creation language is predominant in these five verses and a number of lexical creation markers appear in the three passages. Bara, to create, Yatsar, to form, and Asa, to make. Interestingly, all these markers are participles, a syntactic peculiarity which can be found throughout the book of Amos. He does that all the time. Uh, God's creative activity in each instance is brought into relationship with the human sphere, indicating how creation touches human life. One can perceive a certain progression among the three hymns in terms of how God's intervention impacts humanity. In Amos 4.13, God reveals to humankind his intent to judge, whereas Amos 5, 8, and 9 describes the destructive aspect of God's judgment. Amos 9, 5, and 6 finally describes the human reaction to the divine judgment. The startling aspect of Amos's presentation of creation is that it's intrinsically linked to judgment in such a way that creation almost seems to form the explanation for destruction. What starts as a hymn of praise for Yahweh, the creator, becomes a threatening description of Yahweh, the judge. This apparent contradiction has startled a number of scholars, and most likely, and more deliberately, Amos' audience. The position of inherent security based on the belief in the creator God is challenged by Amos. And what has provided a basis for a false religious autosufficiency now becomes the rationale for judgment, reversing the original function of the hymns. By means of the hymns, Amos makes it clear that Yahweh is not a God who could simply be controlled. He challenged certain positions of presupposed rights, by means of which the pre people presumed the right of existence. After all, aren't we the chosen people? From the broader perspective of God's creation. Thus, creation can be contextually oriented towards both comfort and judgment, whereas in Amos it is mostly directed towards judgment. To accept Yahweh as the creator also implies the, the acceptance of his power to decreate. At first sight, creation used in this way is dissociated from salvation, but when judgment is understood as preliminary and partial to salvation, then decreation becomes a necessary precursor for the recreation. The old man has to die before the new man can be born. Amos drives this point home by the formulaic usage of the expression Yahweh Semo, the Lord is his name. Indicating that this is still God, he is not only the God who creates, but he also destroys. The book of Amos concludes with a glorious perspective on restoration after judgment. Amos 9, 11 through 15, introduced by the eschatologically charged phrase, Bayom Hahu, literally, in that day. The passages allude, allude to the creation theme by employing building terminology. For example, Bana, to build, Amos 9, 11, and 14, and the metaphor of Yahweh as king. So this is creation terminology repurposed. Thus, within the theological thinking of Amos, the correct understanding of creation becomes a prerequisite to the comprehension of recreation. Hosea. Creation in Hosea is closely linked to the theme of the creation of Israel as a nation. Again, as with Amos, in a context of pending judgment. Creation is not only analogous to history, but history is history itself. Hosea begins to develop his creation theology with a description of decreation in Hosea 4, 1 through 3, where an interesting reversal of the order of creation presented in Genesis 1 takes place. God is entering into a rib, a controversy or legal case, 
with or against Israel. In the relationship-focused narrative context of Hosea, this could be better understood as a quarrel between husband and wife, which constitutes the underlying metaphor of the book. You may remember Hosea had some trouble with his own wife. Uh, based on Israel's sins, Hosea 4.2, verse 3 invokes a judgment by introducing the creation, namely the anti-creation theme. Therefore the land will mourn, and all who live in it will waste away, note people, the beast of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the fish of the sea will be extinguished, going backwards in creation. The three groups of animals represent the three spheres where life is found on earth, and the reversal of their known creation order invokes the idea of judgment as decreation, where creation just shrivels up when confronted with and abused by sin. The affinity between Hosea 6.2 and Deuteronomy 32.39, I'm going to quote those texts next, can hardly be overlooked in this context and constitutes another creation motive in Hosea. The reference to Yahweh as the one who puts to death but also resurrects is pointing to the God of creation, which is a theme strongly developed in the Song of Moses. Um, in Hosea, after two days he will revive us, and the third day he will raise us up and we will live in his sight. And uh, Deuteronomy, see now that I, even I, am he, and there is no God with me. I kill and I make alive, I wound and I heal, neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. Hosea 8.14 picks up the same motif, again establishing a relationship with the Pentateuch in using the divine creation epithet Ose from Asa, uh, literally maker, which also occurs repeatedly in the Song of Moses, Deuteronomy 32, 6, 15, and 18. However, the notion of creation leads towards indictment and, sent and, and sentence, not towards praise. For Israel hath forgotten his maker in the building, and buildeth temples, and Judah hath multiplied fenced cities, but I will send a fire upon his cities, and it shall devour the palaces thereof. There's a, you can see that he's forgotten his maker. Possibly the strongest creation text in Hosea is found in Hosea 11.1, 1, and it synthesizes a passage as mentioned above into the metaphor of Yahweh as the creator and procreator of Israel. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. I, this verse connects to Hosea 1.10, they will be called children of the living God, and to the Exodus, which is described in creation terminology. Thus the creation of Israel as a nation during the historic events connected with the Exodus from Egypt become part of God's creation. I will have to confess that this seems a little bit weak to me. Uh, if you read the rest of Hosea, you can't find uh, the creation motif anywhere else in uh, Hosea 10 or 11. Who God elects, he also creates, and with that, an intimate and eternal bond is created like that between a father and his son. Beyond reiterating and enhancing creation theology, the metaphor is pedagogic in its rhetoric. By means of this theme of Israel's creation, it is not so much the intention of Hosea to nuance the view that the people had of Yahweh, but rather to confront them with their own behavior. They are faithless sons. Micah. Affinities and intertextual is issues between the messages of Micah and Isaiah are numerous and have been noted repeatedly by many scholars. The most often quoted passage in this context is the almost identical parallel found in Micah 4, 1 through 3 and 5 and Isaiah 2, 2 through 5. While the passage can be taken as an argument for a common prophetic message of the two prophets, for the purposes of this study, the focus rests on the creation imagery which is transmitted in an eschatological setting via the metaphor of Mount Zion. And I'm going to go through those two texts. Here's 4.1 compared with Isaiah 2.2. 2. But in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the tops of the mountains and it shall be exalted above the hills and people shall flow unto it. Versus, and, and I'm sorry for that double and there. It shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains, 
and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. That would um, that would get plagiarism if you were uh, <laughs> if you were a, a student. And again, the the next verse from each passage, and many nations shall come and say, and many people shall go and say, come ye. Come and let us go to the mountains of the Lord, mountain of the Lord, excuse me, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, or the law shall go forth out of Zion, of, of Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And you can see very, very close parallels there. And then uh, for three, and he shall judge among many peoples and rebuke strong nations afar off, um, virtually identical in Isaiah. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks, um, found in uh, both passages. Nation shall not lift up a sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. And again, virtually identical. And then finally, I'm going to quote four so that you can see what's in between in, um, in Micah. And then five, which is the actual parallel. But they shall sit every, every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken it. And then the parallel, uh, well, for all people will walk everyone in the name of his God. But the... Uh, we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever, or O house of Jacob, come ye and let us walk in the light of the Lord. So it's the parallel kind of starts to um, fade off a little bit there, but you can see the first, first three sets of verses are just really, really close. According to Old Testament cosmology, Zion lies at the center of the created world, and Micah points to its establishment in terms of creation terminology to establish. Creation in Michael is focused on destruction and consequent recreation in the context of the day of the Lord with its eschatological implications. The prophet builds a theological bridge between creation in the beginning and in the end around the presence of God as symbolized by the Mount Zion metaphor. And it's kind of interesting because uh, um, the connection between the Seventh Day part of Seventh Day Adventist and the Adventist part has been recognized by Adventists for some time, but it looks like it, you can trace it all the way back to the Old Testament. Isaiah, as previously mentioned, Deutero Isaiah was the point of departure for Gerhard von Rad and others in establishing an Old Testament theology of creation, based on the assumption that Isaiah 40 through 55, that's Deutero Isaiah, and there's a the third Isaiah, that's 56 through 66 for what it's worth. Um, that Anyway, that the, the second part of Isaiah could be dated to the post-exilic period. Nevertheless, recent studies which focus on the literary unity of Isaiah, though few scholars would take the argument to its logical conclusion, that is, unity of authorship, and we'll talk about why that is later on, show that creation theology is present throughout the whole book. In, the view of the, in view of the wealth of creation material in Isaiah, I will focus only on a selection of creation texts and motifs that demonstrate the main lines of the prophet's theological thinking on creation. The examples are taken deliberately from across the three divisions proposed by critical scholarship. And thereby Martin Klingbeil is making a, an argument for the literary and uh, historical unity of the book of Isaiah. Which, interestingly enough, we have two scrolls from the Dead Sea Scrolls of Isaiah, and it show, neither scroll shows any uh, uh, dividing point between uh, any parts of Isaiah. It seems to be a unity by the time the Dead Sea Scrolls are around. Taking Isaiah's temple vision as a chronological departure point, Isaiah 6.1 describes Yahweh along the lines of the heavenly king metaphor, which has been identified as elusive to creation. 
The song of the vineyard in the preceding chapter presents an important aspect of creation in demonstrating the interconnection of God's creation and his intervention in history, placing it in the context of Israel's election. Isaiah 5.12 provides a further insight into Isaiah's creation theology. Sin is in reality not acknowledging God's deed in creation. Let me give you that text uh, with the text in front of it so that you can see where Isaiah is going. Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning that they may follow strong drink and so forth. And they're listening to music and the harp and the viol and the tablet and the pipe and wine and are in their feast. But... They regard not the work of the Lord, neither consider the operation of his hands. And that's the creation reference. They don't recognize their creator. In Isaiah 17, 7, the prophet takes up the theme developed by Hosea of Yahweh as the maker of humankind. The image of Yahweh as the potter of Isaiah 29, 16 has already been identified as creation terminology and occurs in all three divisions of the book. Uh, First in Isaiah 29, which is the first division, and then 41 and 45, which are the second division, and 64, which is the third. Creation in Isaiah focused primarily on God's sovereignty over his creation and humankind's failure to recognize his proper position within this world order. Isaiah 40 through 55 has been called the center of Isaiah's theology, Whereas Isaiah 36 to 39 fulfills a bridging role, carefully linking the previous chapters to the remainder of the book. It has been argued that the so-called Deutero-Isaiah introduces creation as a new theological topic to the book, but the preceding observations show that the theme is deeply continuous with the Isaiah tradition. And we're going to see even more evidence of that later on. While creation terminology abounds in the whole book, creation occurs in Isaiah 40 through 55 in connection with the Exodus and the conquest. And there's some texts you can look at placing creation in history. Furthermore, creation is positioned alongside redemption, pointing to the theological significance of the motif in introducing Cyrus as the agent of God's redemption. In this way, the Exodus serves as a typological guarantee for the future redemption from the Babylonian exile through Cyrus. And that, by the way, is why 2nd Isaiah must be dated late, because otherwise it would be true prophecy, and everybody would have to recognize it. The theocentric manifestation that God forms light and creates darkness as much as peace and evil serves as an introduction to God as the potter metaphor, which illustrates the absolute sovereignty of God within the realm of human history. The final division of the book of Isaiah, 56 through 66, focuses on the creation of Zion with chapters 60 to 62 at the center of the section describing the glorious city. The book's grand finale in Isaiah 65 and 66 adds an eschatological dimension to creation theology in Isaiah, describing renewal and restoration in terms of creation. But creation in these last chapters not only refers to Zion as a place, but foremost to its inhabitants who need recreation and transformation. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create, for I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a joy. That's uh, 6518. Um, now, <clears throat> one might be tempted to look at that and say, that's kind of weak. How do you t attach that to creation? Well, actually, if you look at the verse preceding it, which Martin doesn't cite, um, but of course knows about, um, it says, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. And there's bara, and there's Shemayim and Aretz, straight from Genesis 1. In summarizing Isaiah, uh, Isaiah and creation theology, the following becomes apparent. Creation in Isaiah 1 through 39 is focused on God's sovereignty over his creation and the establishment of a personal relationship with humanity exemplified by the usage of the potter metaphor which points back to Genesis 2 that God formed Adam as one might form a potter or as a potter might form clay. In Isaiah 40 through 55 the theme focuses on the creation of Israel as a nation in history by connecting creation with the exodus and theologically with salvation. 
So there's creation, exodus, creation again, uh, creation of the nation, if you want to call it that, and then recreation after the exile. In Isaiah 56 through 66, creation is centered on the future recreation of Zion and its people in response to the failure of a pre-exilic Israel. Thus, we have a sequential development of creation theology in the book of Isaiah, which follows a natural progression of thought. Now, my take on all that, I think Martin Klingbeil makes a good case that the early prophets gave their messages with creation as a backdrop. It would be hard to write a history of creation from the prophets or recreate the text of Genesis 1 and 2, but the prophets seem to be informed by the text of early Genesis as evidenced by vocabulary, metaphors, motifs, and typologies. Some of Klingbeil's arguments seem weak to me. For example, his linking of Hosea 11.1, 1, which I remarked, out of Egypt have I called my son, with creation. But others are even stronger than he notes here, such as his connection of Isaiah 65.18, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create, for I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a joy with creation. Or what I consider uh, an even more interesting omission is non-mention of tohu and bohu, which are only found three times in Scripture, and once in, I, once in Jeremiah, which we'll see next week, once in Isaiah 34, 11, which is first Isaiah, by the way. And... Um, which means that the creation uh, stereotype should have been uh, present by that time. And of course, once in Genesis 1, verse 2. And uh, uh, the earth was tohu abohu, unformed and unfilled, however you want to translate that. His, con his comments on why creation was neglected by previous Old Testament scholars are interesting. Apparently, this neglect stems from the belief that the second part of Isaiah was late and that the Genesis 1 account was also late. It appears that the fundamental assumptions are that history is progressive and therefore it has to be get, the theology has to be getting better and better. The uh, Israelite theology should also be progressive. That's one assumption. And the second assumption is that miracles can't happen. And Prophecy is a miracle, so it can't happen. And that's why 2nd Isaiah has to be uh, dated late. It has to be dated to the time of Cyrus. 2nd Isaiah has to be written after the exploits of Cyrus and the highly polished creation account of Genesis 1 couldn't have started out. It has to have come late. Now, if you think about that, the idea that... that uh, that history is progressive in that sense is belied by the fact that uh, the early church seems to have been much better than the church in uh, the Middle Ages. Um, and so, yes, we do see, um, uh, if you want to call it that, historical entropy. This could be considered to be one form of assuming one's conclusion. To one who does not believe in miracles, the logic that I gave above is compelling. To one who believes, it is a weak argument indeed. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. You have a comment up uh, here. When somebody comes to you and, you know, you, you talk about the Bible and what it says, and somebody says, well, that's literature. It's not literal. When, when somebody tells you that this is literature, what comes to your mind? I mean, is it, is it just a, Imagination? Is it just expressing your feelings? What, what exactly is it? Well, I, I think that when somebody makes a distinction between literature and history in this area, uh, that what comes to my mind is somebody thinks that this is some pretty good novel writing. Um, 
And it raises the interesting question, why would one think that? Um, Herodotus may have been gullible. He may have written some stuff that really wasn't true. But I don't think he intended to. Um, there are a few things that start out intending to be novels. The Book of Judith is a good example, where it starts out immediately where Nebuchadnezzar was king of the Assyrians, which anybody who knew the biblical stories well enough would say, no, no, that doesn't fit. And so that's kind of deliberately set in a, in a historical uh, setting. Now but, the, but the biblical writers, and, and particularly this is true of the prophets, um, they are generally, with the exception of Second Isaiah, which you can't, you know, uh, which if they were to concede, the whole, uh, the whole skeptical uh, project would come tumbling down. Um, generally speaking, they're conceded to be accurate. They're conceded to be you know, Amos is, is a real person. Hosea is a real person who in all probability took himself a wife who had been a prostitute and then who later left him. Um, uh, nobody really questions those kinds of things. Um, or at least very few people do. Because they are, they are written from the point of view of... A, of somebody who wants to make an impact on history. So they lie about it? Well, what these people would say about Second Isaiah is that it's pious fraud. Pious fraud. Fraud still sounds like lying. But, uh, but just say... It, it, it does. I mean, to you and me, it's lying. To them, well, it's kind of... Um, but let me give you an illustration that might make it a little bit easier for you to understand how they view it. Oh, I've got a, an understanding what I think how they view it, but um, it may not um, match with anybody else's. The, the story is told by somebody who talked to Sigrid Horn. Um, uh, I talked to him, but I didn't know enough to talk to, ask him about this particular incident, that he wandered into a German uh, church one day and heard a powerful sermon on the, the resurrection and the second coming. And he listened to it for a while, and he nudged somebody beside him, who's that guy speaking? Well, that's Rudolf Bultmann. <laughs> Rudolf Bultmann, the guy who is demythologizing the Bible for his colleagues, and in the meantime apparently can preach a wonderful sermon. Okay, but it uh, seems like to me that the line is being drawn between literature and history. Are you sure that literature and history, history is true, literature is not true, it's fiction. But what about, what about, what about what? What? What about let me get my thought here <laughs> well well, well uh, Herodotus is Herodotus literature or history well i 'm trying to find out what your idea of literature is. I mean both history and literature are written down right okay so and when you read history. It doesn't really mean that it's accurate either, because not only they might not have written it down correctly, but you might not be reading it correctly. That's true. So, uh, although I think most where, of us will concede that George Washington actually did exist. Well, I'm not going that far. I'm not going that far. I'm talking about details. Uh, well, uh, so uh, George so, Washington probably did not chop the cherry tree down. That's probably a myth, okay? I think it is a myth. And, uh, uh, you know, there are ways of, of trying to determine that, and, and through some of those ways, 
people have tried to make the case that, uh, in fact, uh, and, and I think they've succeeded fairly well, in that this, this is a late story that, that grew up by somebody who is trying to say something, but that um, the historicity is in doubt. Frankly, I don't like stories like that because they do try to, uh, they, they blur the line between history and myth until they're discovered. Okay, I guess what I was trying to, to ask is that we have history and then we have metaphor. Now, metaphor is different than fiction in that it tries to give you an idea of something through illustration. And it seems like when you read the prophets, that's what it's doing. It's not necessarily giving you fiction, but it's giving you more of a metaphor of, of reality. And, and if that's true, well then you still have to draw a line between what's literal and what's metaphor as you're reading the Bible. And that's kind of hard to do sometimes, especially in creation account. Yes, um, it, it does create a problem. And that problem will be compounded when one does not allow oneself to concede that certain passages could have been prophetic. That is to say, if you start out knowing that Isaiah could not have prophesied about the name of the person who would uh, allow the Israelites to come back from their captivity, that that just couldn't have been done a century uh, or a century and a half before, then what happens is that one automatically takes that part of Isaiah and puts it in the later time period. And, uh, and when one either rips Isaiah into two pieces, or as finally happened, into three, or else one takes the entire book and shoves it back. Uh, the problem is that some parts of Isaiah seem to be too well tied to the, the historical era in which they were written. And so what's usually done is they simply rip the book in half. Comment. And another comment over here, or did you, as soon as the, uh, uh, okay. This is whole business of uh, bringing allegory literature into this is a bit formidable and uh, at first first impression is please let's not because it is so vague and it means so much different to everything everybody but in fact all of these books that you're citing and especially are uh, come into that category and we cannot uh, separate a discussion from what is literature and what isn't and what's allegory and what isn't from, uh, from the subject that you've chosen. It's just uh, integral. So we have to discuss it, which may not be very productive because of the nature of the thing. Now I think I heard I'm kind of deaf, so I miss some things and don't get them right sometimes, but I believe I heard it said over on the other side that history you can believe in, literature you can't. Well, just, because, just to show you how different the understandings of what these terms mean, I somehow, perhaps instinctively, but perhaps also based on the literature classes that I've taken, tend to define literature as simply very well-written writing. Uh, some things that are superbly written, I would call literature that don't have much merit otherwise. Uh, and then I run into the danger of having it be analogous to people regarding movies as being art forms when they're utterly trash. 
But, um, and also as an analogy, as some of you may know, I'm really very interested in visual art and uh, painting. I'm quite good. And would regard modernist art as hardly acceptably definable as art. Whereas Sargent or uh, Cezanne even, they're artists, but uh, some of these transgressive artists that uh, fill a skull with urine and call that art, I don't even regard that as art. Um, I think that, um, and I think I heard you say that it resorts this is becoming poetic, therefore it is theologic. I may have misunderstood what you said, but I thought that was very insightful. Well, what Klingbeil is saying Certainly is, that is, is seems that, to be true in the Old Testament. Uh, what Klingbeil is saying is that, that if, if, the, if the prophets want to make a really important point, that they tend to slip into a poetic form. I think that is a remarkable statement and observation and insight and uh, as a matter of fact it itself is very poetic. <laughs> You've yes. just put it in poetry. Well you bring up and an, I think an important good. point. Uh, you have drawn many uh, heads of people in your lifetime and uh, they are art. Uh, they are very good art, in fact. But the interesting thing of it is, having known some of those people, I can recognize them from your drawings. And so, in a certain sense, they are history as well as art. And I don't see that there has to be a dichotomy between those two uh, forms. I don't think so. As a matter of fact, uh, the more artistic it is, the more historic it is, <laughs> I, as I see it. Uh, there is a form, there is a, so I say theology of art that wants to reduce a face to its essence. And the more you reduce someone's face to its essence, the less you can even recognize it as the person who it is, or even as a person. You've reduced it to its essence. Now, what does that mean? Uh, reduction to an essence then becomes absurd but it's looked at as the most creative, spiritual, advanced form of art, when in reality it is just the opposite. It is absolutely the most absurd and perverted kind of art. Now, I apologize for bringing art and all this into it, but uh, the subject you've told, chosen, which has to do with these minor prophets, uh, somehow or another it's inextricable and uh, somebody's going to bring it into it. And I do appreciate your doing it, but I believe I've said enough. Comment there, and then we have a comment on the front. Uh, yeah, it, it is sometimes stated that um, there are 27 creation stories in the Bible. And uh, it's of interest to me that uh, None of these speak about the millions of years that uh, current science presents. And I'm really uh, surprised here to a certain extent that all these references, time does not seem to be an important factor, at least in what we discussed today. Uh, it certainly is an important factor in Genesis, but it is not. And uh, it didn't seem to be a pervading preoccupation at that time, in the time past, and it seems to me that time has become a preoccupation, at least a more popular topic, uh, probably mainly because of the, the attempt to exclude God from the uh, paradigm, and uh, then time is necessary to provide the improbabilities that are postulated, and as we know, uh, current concepts of age of the earth are totally inadequate for that, but it's... it's it's, uh, that you're doing it, the best you can. It's interesting to me here that so much of this, it's not an issue. Uh, none of these 27 stories, which oh, I, I don't know how they define the story, but talk about millions of years. Now it's, it's, it's a predominant idea, and I think it, it reflects uh, the current secular 
uh, trend in, in society at present and in societal thinking right now. I think there's one other point that's important in that regard. Just come in. Um, and that is that um, that is that <clears throat> making up a creation story after you have a whole bunch of references is not quite as easy as it sounds. Um, I, I, if I can if I can draw your attention to the Santa Claus myth, um, somebody went to make up an entire kind of if you want to call that theology of Santa Claus, um, in the night before Christmas. And many of the things kind of fit, but there's a couple of, there's a couple of areas where the um, stories don't really fit. One of them is, uh, does, does Rudolph lead the uh, reindeer around? Or, you know, uh, maybe he took over in 1980 or something like that. Um, and the second one is, is Santa Claus fat or skinny? And that may sound like not much, but as I understand it, the original story, St. Nicholas was actually a very thin man. And yet uh, Santa Claus has, um, shall we say, gained some weight. Um, and that's actually when Santa Claus became more popular is because I guess skinny people are just not as sympathetic figures as, as fatter ones. Uh, uh, he has diabetes now, I guess, or whatever. Uh, but the point I'm making is that you have here these references to creation here, there, and the other place. We've seen Tohu Obohu uh, come in in Isaiah. We're going to see it come in in Jeremiah. So you have to put that into the original creation account. But you try to create an original creation account with all these little pieces, it's hard. And it's particularly hard to do it without, um, without disagreeing with some of the, uh, some of the older stories. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if you start out with a creation account and then people can pull bits and pieces out of it and use it as they wish, it's a lot easier. And I think one of the things that Klingbeil is doing in the prophets and that has been done in the Psalms has been done in the wisdom literature and so forth, is to make the point that it looks like the original creation story was in fact Genesis 1, 2, and then the fall in 3. And, and so we're seeing cumulative evidence as we're going through that there's this aspect of creation, there's that aspect of creation, not that you could create the whole story, but that once, this, once the pieces are seen, that you can see that they came from the original story. And that argues that creation is, in fact, um, uh, what the Germans have called the Ergeschichte, or the, the original history. Yeah, there's an element in this whole current series that kind of troubles me. There's a, a type of or area of scholars, scholastic work which is not being presented and built on, and that is analysis of the old Hebrew and defining its age. Now, was, I've only read the summaries because it's not my field, but if you look at Genesis, and especially the earlier part of Genesis, you know, the scholars tell us who are specialists, that this is the oldest form of Hebrew that can be found. So when they come along and try and suggest this uh, chapter from the you know, Psalms or this section of uh, Isaiah is the oldest and original, they haven't got the scholarly basis to say that. And that's why you come into this lightweight literature where they jump to conclusions. You get lots of examples of that today, even in the political arena. People criticize this politician, that politician. When you actually read the original speech, you sit there, where did they get that from? Because there is a media that demands something for the consumer to uh, gobble up in between the adverts. So we, we really ought to demand, even from the scholars of those books next to you, and thorough referencing 
to the scholars who know the ancient language. I mean, you get examples of this, for instance, in the Scandinavian sagas and the Finnish Kalevala, and you get tremendous examples of that in the African oral traditions, which only now are being written into a written form. You realize you're dealing with a tradition that goes back a thousand years, as far as the linguists can tell, because the language has been developing. So you get a single language, say like Finnish. While we were under the Russians, lots of Russian influence and expressions went into the Finnish literature. Afterwards, the German literature. And after World War II, now that 45% of the population are speaking and entertaining themselves with English, you realize that the modern literature is gobbledygook full of expressions from Americanism and from English and Australian expressions. They, they're still Whereas Finnish. you go to the original Finnish, well, uh, the, the, the point is, yeah, I mean, in, in, the, in the Kalevala or in the sagas of the scan, you have a pure language which has, seems to have no influences from anywhere or very difficult to determine. And a person like myself reading Kalevala, I can't understand it. I have to have a translation of it. It's so old, it predates the written form. So the, the scholars yeah. can do this analysis and they, they're telling us the beginning of Genesis in particular is the oldest written form of Hebrew ever other than the book of Job. Whereas when you come to Isaiah and the other minor prophets, hey, you're centuries removed. The link language is just totally different, unless they seem to be quoting something from the earlier manuscripts. Yeah. I, I think that's an important point that you're raising. And it's, uh, uh, I mean, you, you, see that, you see that in the older literature. Uh, but one thing that you have to keep in mind is that in biblical studies, there is also the 600-pound gorilla, and that is Isaiah, second Isaiah has to be late. It just has to be, because otherwise um, the whole project of explaining uh, history without reference to God falls apart. Yeah, but the point I'm saying is I can invent things too and write garbage and novels. But if I don't have a scholarly basis for what I'm saying, I ought to be dismissed right away. And so we need to re dismiss several of these scholars. They come along and saying, well, it has to be because there's no way they could know. In other words, they're non-believers. And a non-believer, even you and me, if we go to read the scriptures without the Holy Spirit inspiring us, we will go astray. So when you have a scholar who starts with the assumption there is no God and there cannot be prophecy, why are we wasting our time entertaining that guy? I'll change the subject. <laughs> Very good thoughts, though. Very good. Much appreciated. Uh, one question I've had as we're going through this book, why don't you see the seven days of creation being brought up and repeated and commented on throughout the rest of the Old Testament? It seems like when you get to the book of Exodus, and once you get past Mount Sinai, all of a sudden, the seven days of creation disappear. Now, the Sabbath is there. Sabbath is in Isaiah, and it's in um, Hosea and Amos, some of these other books. Um, but it's there, it's buried. I'll give you an example in Jonah that I've only seen one scholar comment on the seven days of creation in the book of Jonah. If you add up the chronology of the book of Jonah, there's three days and three nights that Jonah is in the heart of the sea, chapter one, three days and three nights. Right. That kind of parallels the first three days of creation when finally the oceans are named seas on day three, even though they were there on day two and day one. So that covers first three. And he days. was spit out onto the dry land. Then he was spit out on dry land, which is a creation term, yeah. Next he goes to Nineveh. Now there's a break there. It would have taken him weeks maybe to travel that far, who knows, from the Mediterranean Ocean. Although but maybe he went there like Philip, but well, yeah, anyway. Yeah, maybe he was whisked <laughs> off. <laughs> but when he gets to Nineveh, he goes around the city for three days preaching. Now the King James says the city was three days in c circumference, which is a very, very little translation translation, the New King James 
says it's a three-day journey in extent, three days for him to cover the city with preaching. So that brings you to the sixth day of creation, and that's when he's preaching that Nineveh is going to be destroyed. Oh, yes, for 40, sometimes within 40 days. So on the sixth day, honoring the creation of mankind, there's, you know, there's supposed to be big destruction after that. Maybe reminiscent of Jericho. You know, Jericho fell on a Sabbath on the seventh day, right? Because they went around the city once each day and seven times on the seventh day, which most scholars think is the Sabbath and shows yeah. God's creative power on Sabbath. So you might say there's a build-up expecting to see uh, destruction of another great city, even greater than Jericho, on the seventh day. But what happens? They wait a day and... Um, and then they proclaim a fast. And everybody is right. in sackcloth and ashes. And it says, the Lord God planted a plant. Now, there's the story of the plant and Jonah needed shade and that was also on the sixth day. But on the seventh day, instead of destruction of a people, there's destruction of a plant. And that made Jonah morose to the point of being extremely upset and angry. And God said, well, why, why didn't you have decent sympathy for people? And here you have all this sympathy for a plant. That, that was you his... didn't make and that you didn't get rid of. That's right. So creation is woven through there, but it had a surprise ending. Instead of a Sabbath of rest, it was a Sabbath when the, uh, the plant was put to rest. And then God had a message out of that. So the seven days are there. I, I hope I'm not being too creative with this, but there are scholars that recognize there is a sequence here. Oh, and, and, and I think that the interesting thing of it is that it's hard to go backwards from, to the, from that to a creation, but it's easier to see how a creation story could inspire that sequence. Exactly. You have to have the creation story first. It's not exilic. It didn't come late. You have to have the creation story because for sure, Jonah, most, many scholars, even liberals, say Jonah was 8th century because there's enough historical references there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we've had some very good comments here. I appreciate uh, those. And uh, I, we have a creative God, uh, and man made in his image, man also uh, is creative. We have a certain many different uh, forms of uh, creativity. And uh, in thinking of the literature uh, factor here, um, and whether the metaphors and analogies uh, are of just human creation. Uh, Ezekiel, the 16th chapter, and also uh, the 23rd chapter, I think are just tremendous um, illustrations of, of the creativity. And, and hopefully we'll talk about them next week. Okay, all right. But here's examples of creativity. Uh, in liter literature form. And uh, it says, the word of the Lord came to me. So this was not of just uh, prophetic uh, human uh, creativity. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, pro prophecy also, you see. Right. And this is uh, prophetic. This is not of human origin either. And I think there is a real application to our world right today, uh, uh, using the uh, picture of Revelation 17 and 18 uh, of a profligate uh, woman who has many daughters and uh, the parallels uh, of Israel mm -hmm. and modern um, uh, Christianity taking the name of Christ and yet we've gone astray just as Israel did in the past. Some tremendous uh, uh, literature uh, figures here that yeah. come from God. Yeah. 
And it's interesting because creation and the Exodus are both borrowed from by the prophets to make that point. And I, you know, out of Egypt I called my son. Um, does kind of sort of halfway talk about creation, mostly talks about really um, the Exodus, where. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, God basically took a people that had been s enslaved and freed them from slavery and made them into a, a, an actual nation. Yeah, I was uh, wondering, uh, like in Amos, when he talks about the judgment and connects it, and the author connected it with creation, why wasn't that connected with the flood rather than creation? Um, and I don't see that connection there because the the creation is more representative of the compassionate God rather than a judgment God because of the you know the the blessings He gave uh, Adam and Eve through that creation. Um, so you know, in, in so are, are are we seeing kind of a misrepresentation of God like in Amos when he in that in that connection because uh, you know Jonah a contemporary uh, almost contemporary anyway uh, said I, I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God slow to anger and abounding in love a God who relents from sending calamity I mean that's something that they were cer certainly not aware of but like Jonah it says in the previous verse but Jonah this t but to Jonah this compassion seemed very wrong and he became very angry so uh, you know, is the connection with judgment to creation more of driven by the author rather than by the actual character of God? I'm not sure that um, that uh, one could dry, uh, drive a a a uh, major uh, division between those two points. And the reason why is because. In, in the prophets' minds, if God decided to judge somebody and he was doing it appropriately, then that's what needed to happen. And remember, in the creation account, there is this perfect world that God creates. And then man decides on his, and in this case on her as well, own volition to try to manage without God. You don't need God to to be, you know, your benefactor. You can do this on your own. Um, and at that point, we find out that doing it on your own isn't that isn't that helpful. And in fact, when God says, "If you if you try that, you're going to die," that God was correct. And uh, so, right in the Genesis story, there is a theme of judgment. And in the flood, there's a theme of judgment. And in the Exodus, there's a theme of judgment against Egypt, who had been abusing the Israelites. And so, what you're seeing is that you, not only is there a God who is compassionate, but there is also a God who says that a certain point enough is enough. Um, and w compassion is a good thing. I'm not knocking that. I happen to think that uh, we sometimes do way too much judgment. Um, but the fact of the matter is that if you choose certain things, you're stuck with the consequences that you can't choose wrong and expect to get the right answer out of it. That at a certain point, you're responsible for your own decisions. And what happens to you falls on you because of you. And this theme is all the way through Christianity. As I mentioned before, in order to have the new man, you're going to have to have the old man put in subservience, hopefully dying daily. Uh, because otherwise, you live with a conflict, which you don't need. And 
our salvation is really dependent on our recognizing that we of ourselves can't do it alone and are being able to ask for divine help in recreating what should have been there in the, in, in the beginning. And uh, I guess what I'm saying is that inherent in any, in any question of good and evil is the question, well, what do you do about the evil? And the evil has to go one way or another. And it can go because we relinquish it, or it can go because we go with it because we won't let go. That, that in the end, sin cannot be anymore, and those who attach themselves to sin strongly enough that they cannot let go will also have to not be there in the end. And we're, we're all good at, um, you know, the compassion of God. Santa Claus is very nice. Even Santa Claus, though, has, a, has his list of the naughty people, too. Um, but more importantly, our, our God knows who is firmly attached. And in Amos, or pardon me, Hosea, you know, it says, Ephraim is joined to idols, leave him alone. So there comes a point where God does, in fact, judge. And it's a good thing he does, otherwise the entire world would be overrun, which is what happened at the flood virtually. And it's interesting, Noah's building an ark, it's 120 years, he preaches, he saves only his own family. And in a certain sense, not even all of them. Anybody could have walked on that ark that wanted to. Nobody did. Not even the workmen that were hired. Assuming there were some. So, may I answer uh, Steve's yes, question? And then, uh, just uh, briefly. Oh, here. and we have a comment down here. Um, sure. Yes, there is judgment there. There is destruction reminiscent of the flood, even in the book of Amos. And I think you answered correctly that um, God blends his great power together as both power of creation and power of destruction throughout the Old Testament. The, the authors don't clearly differentiate because it's all a sign of God's power and he chooses to unleash it for good or for evil at any time. So in Amos 5, verse 8, it starts out with good, something for an astronomer. Uh, he made the Pleiades and Orion. It says he turns the shadow of death into morning. That's good. And then it says he makes the day dark as night. That's not so good, unless you're an astronomer. You like the darkness. <laughs> and then he calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out on the face of the earth. He rains ruin upon the strong. Verse 9, that's still in Amos 5. And if you go to Amos 9, also you have similar uh, thoughts. So it's blended together. It's there in a poetic way, kind of a creative way. Yes. Uh, picking up on that theme of spiritual bootstrapping or going it alone, which you alluded to a few moments ago. You were talking about that. Um, Dr. Roth here in his book, Science Discovered God, makes the interesting comment that uh, when science dismisses the relevance of God, it is at the same it at the same time accepts a host of really wild ideas that it should evaluate first. Their existence points to a serious bias in the current scientific mindset. He then goes on to quote Michael Polanyi, which said, "This is where I see the trouble, where a deep-seated disturbance between science and all other cultures appears to lie." I believe that this disturbance was in, inherent originally in the liberating impact of modern science on me, medieval thought and has only later turned pathological. Now, it's interesting that he uses that term, uh, that it isn't just a matter of an, an intellectual error. It actually becomes an intellectual and spiritual pathology. Now, we see in human affairs and societies, 
when we try to act out this Nietzschean ideal of the death of God and man becoming God, we get all sorts of aberrations so that something which starts out as a, what you might call a secular humanism turns out to be profoundly dehumanizing. We see this in the leader principle which you notice in so many totalitarian societies and Stalin, Hitler, Mao, Pol Pot, and today in our familiar basket case of the Kim Il-sung dynasty in North Korea where you get all sorts, you get essentially a, to, a, a totalitarian consequences which may be a holocaust. It usually amounts to something like a holocaust so that this secular humanism by its own very nature must degenerate into a very dehumanizing sort of state of affairs. And if, if the naturalist thought this through a little more and, and read history, they might become aware of the uh, poverty of their own thinking. Well, I, I think that's a very important point, and it's, it's of interest that uh, Nietzsche's uh, Ubermensch was adopted more or less straight out by Adolf Hitler. Uh, the superman, the overman, the, the top dog. Um, this, this kind of, this kind of, we can go it alone. And it's interesting to me that it afflicted the nation that is arguably the most advanced in its day on the face of the earth. And I have some people question me, but you go back to the you go back to the old literature. The German theologians were on top of everything. The uh, uh, s German scientists were were right there with the English uh, uh, on top of everything. And the English are kind of, you know, uh, kissing cousins of the Germans. Um, and uh, I mean, uh, you know, calculus it was Leibniz along with Newton. Um, and then, and then if you go to if you go to music, <laughs> don't even start. <laughs> Their military was on top of everything too. That's right. So I mean, what it means is that the best of man, if it deliberately cuts itself off from God, can expect this. And so we should have some sympathy for uh, the top dogs. And then the other thing is that it, it should induce a certain amount of humility because right now in the world, America is the top dog. Raises some very interesting questions. And look what the... Well, I don't want to go there. <laughs> look what we've got in our Yes, election. yes, look what we've got in our election. Anyway... On that note, perhaps we should quit and uh, come back next week and study the other prophets. <laughs>